Hello, everybody. Welcome to Dimitar Sasilov's Q&A session for the Cancer and Evolution Symposium. We really appreciate your participation today. Um, we're going to do it more conversation style. Um, so if you have a question, feel free to put yourself off of mute and just say your question and Dimitar, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Tana. Welcome everybody. Uh, normally I would say good afternoon, but since we are all around the world, those uh, greetings no longer make a lot of sense. So hello, everybody. And thank you for coming to this uh, session. It's always fun to have time to talk pe to people after the conference, usually in person during uh, uh, drinks or dinner time, but uh, in Zoom, that's usually in that format. So please feel free to ask me anything about uh, the talk or the topic that I try to cover. I know I'm not a cancer expert at all. So, uh, and being an astronomer, of course, you can even ask me about the asteroid touchdown, which happened yesterday. Well, Dimitar, if you don't mind, would you want to give a quick synopsis for anyone who maybe wasn't at your talk, since all of the videos were just published, give a quick synopsis of what your talk was about, and then I would love to hear exactly about what you just mentioned. Uh, thank you. That's a good point. So, yes, uh, just uh, in a few um, words, um, I um, represent the work of a uh, um, group of um, faculty with their labs at Harvard, which we call ourselves the Harvard Origins of Life Initiative. And um, our main uh, goals are focused on developing um, a chemical system which behaves like a protocell. In fact, a protocell uh, purely chemically. Um, so um, it will be represented by a genetic molecule, uh, which is RNA or RNA-like um, uh, molecule. We think there may be slight modifications from the canonical RNA we have in modern life uh, that will make such a system uh, um, be able to non-enzymatically self-replicate, make copies evolve, uh, uh, exist without um, uh, originally having enzymes. And in fact, uh, our hope is that the first enzymes will be ribozymes, meaning RNA strands, which have enzymatic properties, which as you uh, know, have been known to exist in modern life um, uh, and are called ribozymes, um, but also the development of actual enzymes. So in that way, this connects to the evolution part of the Cancer and Evolution Symposium. It's in a sense, the uh, origins of evolvability or the beginning of evolution uh, that we are trying to uh, understand by developing such a system, a system of protocells. And um, the reason astronomers and geochemists like me are involved at all in uh, this project of de developing a protocell in the lab is because our team of biochemists and uh, geochemists uh, realized or tried a different approach from everybody else working on the origins of life over the last hundred years. And that approach is to uh, basically um, use uh, information, geochemical information um, uh, that we have from either early Earth or Mars or even astrophysical um, uh, initial conditions to develop the chemical pathways which are needed to uh, put together a protocell functioning in the lab. And so far, I have to report that has been very successful uh, and we've uh, come to the point of being very close to developing such a protocell, a functioning protocell. 
one aspect of this which relates to the Cancer and Evolution Symposium and which I highlighted in my talk is that once we are able uh, to get to the point of um, polymerization uh, when RNA um, is uh, uh, actually uh, polymerized in the uh, sample with uh, the protocells and is starting to non-enzymatically replicate, um, we have a situation in which it's uh, uh, self-repairing properties become very important to the whole project and we believe to the origin of life. In other words, we do require a certain amount of UV light as a driver for the synthesis of the building blocks. But then the polymers, as you all know, um, are susceptible to UV damage. And it is, as we're discovering, uh, the same kind of uh, uh, photo lesions or UV damage that are responsible for skin cancer. So our work is actually benefiting from work that has been done on skin cancer, uh, but we take it a step further uh, to try to understand how, uh, what kind of sequences, and we discover that the actual uh, encoding of the RNA matters here. What kind of sequences are more likely to self-repair efficiently in the absence of uh, repair enzymes. So remember, there are not, it is before the time there were enzymes which will do the repair. So obviously, uh, the original um, uh, protocells were, um, they had replication with huge uh, error um, uh, budgets. Uh, but the issue here is could they uh, slowly evolve into the situation in which? Uh, they will develop enzymes that will help them speed up the repair and the error correction. And that period is um, depends very much on the self-repair properties of these uh, small strands of RNA. So we are making a lot of progress in understanding and uh, working with self-repair. And um, that's essentially um, kind of the abstract of what I was trying to give you as a, a short talk at the symposium uh, to tell you that there are interesting parallels between what people, especially in the skin cancer community are doing and what we in the origins of life community are trying to do. Okay, yeah, good. This, uh, uh, this is Henry Han. I, uh, Hi, Henry. I, yeah, how how I enjoy your talk, and I have a couple of questions. I were sure. I will try. Yeah. Yes. So the uh, three questions related to uh, uh, your talk, and uh, I also have some questions. Uh, you should, uh, because you are expert in that field, I, I I will ask your opinions. So the first question is uh, you're talking about the uh, in your system. The repair is actually fundamentally important. So, do you think the repair process actually, on the surface, is repair, but in fact, is a new way to create new information? Mm, Henry, that's a very good question. Um, so, uh, the answer is yes. I think the answer is absolutely yes. And I will, it's, it's deeper than simply, oh, you know, you flip some bits and now you have a different word. It is not about that. Uh, it is more about the capability of the uh, uh, RNA strand to um, develop function. Remember, um, RNA in this protocells or in this project uh, plays a dual role. It plays the role of a genetic um, um, molecule, which will remember some of the um, uh, interesting properties that help us help it sustain or 
make the cell membrane, for example, um, uh, better, but it plays also the role uh, of an enzyme. First and foremost, it should be a replicase because it needs to be able to quickly make good copies of itself um, for many reasons, but basically otherwise we will not have a population. We will have nothing. So second, uh, we hope that it will have, it will start developing enzymatic um, properties which relate to the stability of the membrane because those membranes for the protocells are essential um, in order for uh, our, the RNA strands to actually have enough time to explore um, um, genome space. Uh, so we have no, uh, people have thought about it, but we have, nobody has come up with a better idea than compartmentalization into cells. Okay, so then your molecule has to be able to do two things, to keep information with a certain amount of fidelity, not uh, too error prone, and to act as an enzyme, as a primitive enzyme, at least for its own good, you know? Uh, obviously it's always for its own good and so on. So, okay, so in order for you to be an enzyme, you usually need to have a, a core cofactor or something which uh, does the, enables the chemistry for you. Well, originally, we, some of us are working on involving uh, iron sulfur clusters, but originally that was probably not easy and prevalent. So some of the original um, um, enzymatic properties of RNA strands must have been related simply to its folding, to three-dimensional structures where it has either uh, pins or loops uh, in its short strand, uh, you know, secondary structure, which enable or uh, speed up or do something of that sort. In this case, it is really helpful if those particular uh, kinks in the structure uh, can uh, accept and use additional energy. Because remember, this is be before we have ATP and things which can do that for you. And so uh, the what we're understanding is that the mechanism which is responsible for self-repair is the same mechanism which is also responsible for certain um, um, uh, enzymatic properties which um, are photorelated. Just like in modern life, you have photoliases. So the flavin related ones do not have a metal uh, related cofactor. They use photons or they use light energy in order to enact a certain catalysis or a certain chemical reaction. So it's a biological function which depends on UV light. So what we think is that the same sequences which appear to be GAC related, which have the stacking and the uh, electronic clouds, the pi pi kind of structure to accept the UV photon and kind of distribute it, distribute the excitation between themselves along the stacking, not in one base, but several bases, uh, uh, allow that uh, energy to be stored and then deposit it where necessary. This is a biological function. And in, in fact, because it is uh, base related, code related, it is in a sense what you just um, asked me or what you surmised that actually uh, what we call self-repair is also, uh, or UV driven self-repair is also a type of additional information which relates to biological function. Does mm -hmm. this make sense or did I talk too long? Yeah, make, make sense. Uh, so so if anyone else have a question you want to ask, go ahead. But otherwise, I will continue <laughs> because it's so fascinating and interesting. 
So Go the second, so the second question is, uh, do you think it's a naive question? Do you do you think you 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 put too many or too much complexity at the first place? Because uh, I always thinking that there is a, a evolve process. Initially, player is not the player right now. So they may don't have the enzyme. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, so, so, yeah. so therefore, I mean, maybe that inheritance is completely unlike the inheritance we are talking about right now. So yes. are yes. you actually open the uh, you know, option to <laughs> search for that? I think that because the, the system replacement, we actually fully convinced by the evolution process. So for example, you put the enzyme, are you thinking everything important? But maybe initially there's a no need of memory at that time. Just yeah. the high, so, so, so how, how do you think of this? Well, um, I like uh, your question and your idea because I'm an astronomer. So in physics and astronomy, we always try to simplify the system. <laughs> so uh, more complexity is, is worse because then you have too many options and uh, too many things could have happened or, you know. So as a physicist, I, I prefer to keep the system as simple as possible. And so the question is, um, what, what is a simpler option that would work under natural conditions? And so um, uh, that's one question. The second question, which is even more basic, is what is a simpler system, regardless of whether it works under natural conditions or not? And actually one of our uh, members of our Harvard Origins of Life initiative team is working exactly on a project like that. Instead of working on RNA and ribozymes and membranes and with fatty acid lipids and so on and so on, he is actually saying, how can I build a simpler model, completely artificial? So I don't care whether it can uh, ever happen on a planet in the universe anywhere. But I want it to be, become a protocell nevertheless and see how it behaves. And um, he's using very artificial building blocks, very simple artificial building blocks. And uh, he's not the first one to try that, by the way. Uh, there is now a, a fairly active community, I would say in the last 10 years, um, but especially in the last few years, uh, who are um, building synthetic life or synthetic cells. Uh, in Europe as well as in the United States, um, my colleague here at Harvard, but we have people in Minnesota, we have people in Germany, and they haven't been able to pull it off yet, Henry. So, so basically I'm very interested in uh, seeing where this is going to go. Uh, but I watched it for a few years in the beginning before I committed myself to the RNA uh, approach. And basically what happened is the people who are working with RNA have made more progress than the people who are working with the simpler building blocks. Uh, and when I say progress, this is what I mean. Uh, it is actually easier to synthesize uh, the nucleotides for RNA if you choose the right conditions. Uh, they simply come out after um, the end of the synthesis, about seven steps are necessary, not too much UV light and not any uh, inter intervention from the graduate student in the lab, you know, it just works out by itself and start self-assembling, polymerizing uh, as long as the fatty acids are there. And the fatty acids right now are part of the synthesis for the nucleotides. So you actually end up with a, a bunch of uh, soap bubbles, you know, uh, protocell membranes and the mononucleotides and the oli oligomers, that is the small strands of RNA, whether you want it or not. And even an astronomer like me was able to pull this off. <laughs> and so basically then um, um, people smarter than me said, well, wait a minute, there are simpler um, 
uh, backbones than RNA, the ribo. Um, why not try TNA, which is a trio, it's much simpler backbone. You don't have to worry about some. So they tried all the different uh, options. Actually, there is ribo, there is arabino, there is TNA, there is GNA, and so on. And it turned out that all out of these four different options, RNA won every time. It's easier to synthesize. It behaves better in the polymerization and the replication process. And even if you pollute, meaning if you mess up your RNA with some Arabino and with some GNA and TNA, in the process of self-replication, it kind of uh, pushes away the wrong nucleotides and eventually homogenizes. That's a fairly new work from Jack Shostak's lab, which is only partially published at this point, but uh, basically it's very exciting because it shows that there is something special about RNA. So this said, uh, I'm still, um, as a director of the initiative, I'm still supporting, which means funding, uh, my colleagues who are trying to do the simpler model, uh, meaning just start with something more simple than RNA and don't worry about enzymatic properties by, per se. But right now, my money, my bet is that RNA actually will win over. And engineering-wise, it may actually give us an idea of why this is the case. And as engineers, we may improve on that eventually. But you know, first you have to, it's a so-called biologically inspired engineering. Let's see how it works uh, first, understand the mechanism, and then simplify it. That's kind of my current approach. Does it make sense to you? Or? Make, make, make sense, make sense. You convinced me. Well, uh, we will want to convince you with actual experiments. So uh, see, the good thing about being an astronomer, my bar is very low. If I can do it, the chemistry, then if anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So we've got another question from Viral Tagal. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He asked, do you think or do you have any data whether the spontaneous formation of organic molecules or protocells on Earth has already stopped or might they still be occurring at some undiscovered site of Earth even today? That's a very good question. In fact, that was the first question the president of Harvard asked me when I went uh, to him to say, hey, give us some money to do this project. <laughs> uh, he was very interested. It actually was back uh, when Larry Summers was the president. And he asked that question, among other questions, you know, why do you need so much money? <laughs> the first one, but uh, no, uh, it's a very good question. Um, the, the, Honest answer is we don't know for sure hundred percent, but we I could say um, we probably know ninety nine percent that this process uh, cannot occur today. Uh, the first reason why people would say this process cannot occur today is because essentially every nook and cranny on this planet under the surface, on the surface, in the atmosphere, in the oceans, everywhere is populated by some form of life, usually bacteria, microbes, and they would eat anything that is tasty like this. And the building blocks of uh, life as we know it uh, are very um, useful to life as we know it. Okay, so if you sprinkle some of those monomers or some of the feedstock molecules um, in an environment in which they are bacteria, they'll, they'll use them right away uh, for their um, you know, uh, nut nutritious properties. So that we kind of know already. The second uh, uh, reason why we think that um, uh, process is not happening today but we are not 100% sure here because we haven't figured out that's what happened in the past, is if we are right in terms of what actually um, uh, happened or what happens at the origin of life and what it takes to build those building blocks and those protocells, then the environment is extremely different from the environment 
almost anywhere, I would say anywhere on the earth today. Uh, the, the early earth uh, was of course uh, anoxic. There was no free oxygen, either in the water or in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, but that's not the only difference. Uh, in fact, there are areas on the earth today which are anoxic and they are bacteria which very happily live there. Uh, including our gut. Uh, <laughs> but basically, uh, the uh, anoxic environment on early Earth led to a very different general geochemistry. So instead of this being pockets of anoxic uh, areas, as it is in modern Earth, uh, in ancient Earth, um, the overall geochemistry was drastically different in terms of the chemical potentials and what minerals and gases were available and what were not. So some of the chemistry which is needed or necessary uh, to uh, do this synthesis and to build these protocells, including the UVC light which drives the process, uh, completely unavailable anywhere on the earth today. And so these are the three reasons why we think, uh, me and my colleagues, we think that um, the processes that we are studying in the lab today uh, are not possible anywhere on the earth today. Um, uh, in geology, as you know, we look for um, evidence that uh, this indeed happened in the past, but we unfortunately have a big problem here on the earth that we cannot uh, study the rocks or the period of time and the geology of the earth, which we call prebiotic, when the protocells must have formed and the initial biosphere just started. This was before 3.9 billion years ago, and there is no preserved rock record on the earth of that period because of the process of plate tectonics, which recycles the crust of the earth and uh, unfortunately, uh, that record has been erased to the best. I mean, people, people have been looking for all the rocks for 100 years now and continue to look very hard. And currently, the idea is that probably we will never find anything older than 4 billion years. So our main hope to answer your question, uh, Vural, is that uh, we will be able to find this geochemistry preserved in the rock record on Mars. And in fact, the current Mars um, uh, uh, Perseverance uh, um, rover is going, as part of its program, is going to look for that record. We have some predictions of what feedstock molecules should have been preserved in the sedimentary record uh, on early Earth and on Mars, uh, because the geochemistry of both planets was similar four billion years ago. And we hope to find that on Mars because we don't really hope to find this on Earth. So if we find it, at least we will know that the geochemistry is correct. Of course, um, if we find that the geochemistry on Mars led to protocells and to some life, that will be amazing. Uh, we hope we find something like that. But even if that didn't happen on Mars for one other reason, um, then at least we will be uh, more secure in understanding the geochemistry. And hence, partially your uh, question of whether the same thing that happened early on could happen today and why it doesn't happen. So good question. Thank you. So. I want to follow up that question. Do you think from the pure information point of view, do you think the information, different information can inhibit with each other? So for example, if you know, you're talking about the biological organism just eat up the agent to form the complex uh, molecule. But uh, from information point of view, do you think the, you know, the higher degree of the complexity of information themselves could inhibit the simple type of information or not. Because that actually is quite interesting to thinking about uh, whether or not the building this whole process 
is after you miss that time of window from information point of view, you actually miss such an opportunity. Um, that is a, a deep question, Harry. Uh, I think that is part of the big question. And I think that is part of the big question for why it will be really great to succeed in our project. Because once we have those protocells that you can self-sustain, grow in the lab, and we hope many people will do that, then you have the opportunity to explore a whole host of questions like this. Because unlike engineering uh, microbes today and minimizing their genomes, like the minimal, minimal genome uh, cell, you know, that project where you try to, to miniaturize, minimize what already, which as you know, uh, hasn't succeeded despite people trying very hard. And we think we know why, because it's basically, we don't understand uh, the basis of that. That's actually the, at the core of this uh, symposium is that people are thinking in old fashioned terms by trying to minimize the genome and don't understand that it's a lot more than simply the code. Um, but if you had the opportunity to develop a protocell like the one I'm describing, where you build your own and you, you can evolve it in the lab by accelerated evolution, in any case, for those things, evolution will be accelerated because things will be happening every day or every hour, you know, um, then you can, you can do an experiment to answer your question. And not only to answer it, but to actually see what determines the rate, how fast or how large uh, of a ratio or a difference would make a difference. You see, um, I, I think uh, that to me, that is probably the most exciting aspect of this. Uh, that is, if we succeed, that we will be able to understand the interconnection between information and chemistry. What Perry Marshall likes to say, you know, information or cognition is at the beginning. Well, as an astronomer, I know it's not at the beginning because you need the star and the elements first. But as an origin of life person, I actually agree with him because basically you cannot call all these things life until they are self-sustained. But when they are self-sustained, they already uh, have the cognition factor, the information, you know? And so the question is, when does this occur? And I think if we can do a real experiment, that will be the most amazing answer we'll get out of this whole project, uh -huh. you see? Because, because otherwise uh, it's a mathematical project project and uh, you know you can improve on Eigen and other people you know in the mathematics but you know as a physicist it seems to me that mathematics is giving you multiple options and chemistry and nature will choose a subset of them maybe not a single one but at least some of them will work and others will not work mm -hmm. simply because Carbon is carbon and, you know, hydrogen is hydrogen. And there are some parameters which you cannot change. I mean, there are only that many atoms with which you can play. So I, I don't think that there are infinite ways to make life, you know, from atoms. Uh, but I also don't think there is only one. Um, but the answer is we don't know. We know there is one, obviously, here we are. Uh, but this, is there an alternative biochemistry? We don't know that. And uh -huh, uh -huh. that is why if we develop a protocell uh, in the lab, we'll be able to answer those questions. Sure. And sure. as an astronomer, to me, this is very important because you, you all know that we astronomers like to say, oh, we're searching for life out there in the stars. We are actually millions and billions of dollars are spent by the astronomy community to build telescopes to look at planets like the earth and see if they'll have life on it but 
we the astronomers have no clue what to look for. I, I can tell you honestly that. And this is the reason why I'm actually doing what I'm doing. Because I hope that if our lab project succeeds, all our labs, I mean, not uh, just mine, uh, and people really jump onto it, we will learn so much about that basis, basic nature of what it is, and whether there are multiple biochemistries or just one, that we will then, we the astronomers will know what to look for. Because if there is only one biochemistry, just like there is the universal law of gravitation, then with the universal law of gravitation, I know exactly how to look for planets in a different galaxy, because I know that it is the same law of gravitation. If there is some universal law of biochemistry, then I will know what to look for on those other uh, exoplanets and uh, potentially discover it. So basically, uh, your question is at the core of this whole project, I think. And I don't know the answer, but I would like to <laughs> find it. So, uh, uh, someone actually asked another follow-up question. Yeah. yeah, let me, here we go. So as another follow-up question, is it known whether organisms still have genesis, uh, gen genesis sets in their genomes evolved yes. to protect the organisms from the harsh conditions of 3.9 million years ago and whether these genesets can be activated if the correct stimulus such as gamma rays and so on is given to the cells uh, very good question the answer is we don't know but we are coming close to know that and this is exactly um how I answered one of the questions after my talk, you know, what, what good is what you guys are doing for us here? <laughs> uh, basically, uh, these self-repair mechanisms uh, where UVC light uh, uh, damages and then helps repair some of that damage on RNA strands uh, could be one of those, exactly one of those gene sets meaning a sequence of G's and A's and C's uh, that are capable of surviving better uh, because they are self-repairing better. And so in terms of skin cancer today, that will be useful to know, of course. Uh, so um, uh, we haven't found one yet um, that is um, clearly um, uh, going back to that original environment. But part of our project is to find that. And I'll tell you why it's an uh, important part of uh, our project, and particularly my group. Uh, in my group, we are looking at that for the following reason. We are uh, essentially trying to find an independent way to, uh, to convince ourselves that these environmental conditions were indeed necessary for the origin of life on Earth. And so we are trying to find what in today's life has been preserved as um, kind of, um, um, uh, you know, um, back from that time. And uh, if we find it, uh, we can use it as evidence that indeed this was important. I'll tell you uh, why in our science community, this is important, is because there are other scenarios, and some of them pretty good, for the uh, possible origin of life on Earth, which are very different from the one that we are pursuing in our uh, team. For example, there is a scenario in which um, the entire process of origin of life occurs at the bottom of the ocean uh, in hydrothermal vents. And one of the important and stated reasons why um, uh, the scientists who are pursuing that scenario are doing so is because they want to get away from UVC light from the surface. They want to be away from the surface. And they say UVC light is detrimental or inhibits what we, the chemistry which we think uh, um, was um, uh, responsible for origin of life and the first protocells. So uh, to some extent, uh, this is indeed uh, part of this project is trying to understand which scenario uh, is worth pursuing 
and we are looking for this kind of gene sets or evidence, if you will, generally speaking, of the harsh conditions four billion years ago in um, uh, the molecular biochemistry of life today. Because we think that some of this uh, has been preserved to this day. You know, it's conserved, as you would say. But at this point, we haven't found one uh, or enough to convince our other colleagues. So we are working in, in parallel, you know? So uh, that's kind of the answer to your question, Varel. So I have another question is, uh, so you're talking about when you build up this evolutionary process, you're always thinking you put a certain randomness and then you see some pattern and then you, you're thinking the system is gradually built upon, you know, in this way. And we actually believe that uh, until almost uh, 20 years ago, we found the uh, Darwinian evolution of thinking actually a small accumulation, great, great change that never happened. Yeah. Yeah. Why well, almost like in the, you guys talking about the big bang, everything all of a sudden. And we think the complexity also at the cell level is also follow this type of a change. So, so they're just fooling around all of a sudden in the perfect storm, the information is just there. But the key is not that you got the information. The key is how you can maintain such information. Yes. Right. So, so therefore, in that case, I almost, uh, you know, want to suggest many people study involve the evolutionary process. Don't put too much effort to thinking small accumulation gradually change. If it's not happen, maybe you know some of the incidental or accident events actually have more importance in the uh, uh, complexity. Yes. and I wouldn't call it accident because what we see is that it actually keeps happening over and over again in the lab. Uh, now, the project is not yet 100% finished, so I will only make a strong statement when we have completely finished. But my hunch to answer your question is that's exactly what is happening. Sure. So basically, the chemistry which leads to the protocell only takes about one to two hours, which is instantaneous for all uh, you know, geological time of millions of years, one or two hours is super instantaneous. So basically, um, you know, in my naive thinking many years ago, I was also thinking about, oh, well, there is plenty of time. There is a 500 million years. You can try all kinds of different combinations and, you know, eventually you'll get there. This is absolutely uh, impossible, in fact. Uh, and the reason it's impossible because uh, this whole prebiotic chemistry is a set of steps. It's a multi-step synthesis. And in uh, uh, synthetic chemistry, there is a particular term or concept which is called the arithmetic demon. That is people who synthesize polymers, for example, things like that, which take a few steps they know that they, they yields at every step have to exceed 50% in order to have a significant yield of the final product. Well, this is very relevant to the origin of life chemistry, to prebiotic chemistry. And so basically what I'm saying here is it either goes or doesn't go. If yeah. you, your yields are low, no matter how many universes you're going to wait uh, or trillions of years, it, it just will never happen. Yes, yes. Uh, it's not a matter of slow and waiting a long time. So we, we have, uh, sorry for interrupt, we have uh, the, the, the explanation to that because you need the many, many years to produce so many and to populate the whole space. Rather than, you know, initially like Darwinian idea thinking is yeah. you need, a, you know, the many, many generation you become different. Now we know actually the, the you already become different, but they need the time and the chance to become popularized this, the whole world in such a way. Yes. So that's actually quite different, quite yeah. interesting. These are two different things. I agree. Yes. I, I appreciate that. So the back to the information part. So a few years ago, and uh, at that time, we were talking about uh, how to put the self-organization process into the evolution. So I actually proposed the sandwich model. So it's always 
So you have the self-emergent, but they have different way of emerging. But only some of them find the way to maintain such a pattern to emerge. So that is with the help of evolutionary selection as a filter. Yes. But, but as soon as you get off this filter, the game is over because you continually maintain the information, do the same thing. Yes. So that is what I was saying. This is kind of in chemistry terms is uh, uh, beating the arithmetic demon. That is, you have a way to always get to the next level uh, uh, and maintain that information to then further uh, go forward. And, uh, it, and that's why it always works, as opposed to sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. You sure. know? So, so what, what's the term you say that the chemistry is beating? In, chemistry, in synthetic chemistry, it's called arithmetic demon, D-E-M-O. Uh, Owen, like yeah. the demon, you know, uh, that like uh, in physics, we have a similar thing, it's called the Maxwell demon. Um, so it was uh, coined in the 100 years ago, maybe even more than 100 years ago. So thermodynamicists were talking about Maxwell's demon, and the chemists were talking about the arithmetic demon. Uh, it simply means that you, it's, I don't know why it's called that way, frankly. I mean, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's not, a, it's a very simple arithmetic and it's also has nothing to do with demons. So <laughs> it's, <quite laughs> crazy. But, uh, it's basically, it's a simple formula which says that the final yield of a synthesis, chemical synthesis depends on the individual yields at every step to the power of the number of steps. So y to the power of n. And you can see if you have five or six, seven steps, which is the case with uh, prebiotic chemistry, your yields go to the power of seven or more. And if you're below 50%, you end up with nothing at the end. So that's called the arithmetic demon. Actually, I, <laughs> I asked a few chemists in the chemistry department today you know, hey, uh, tell me about the arithmetic demon, and they didn't even know the word. But it's <laughs> textbooks. Uh, well, the problem is that uh, it happens in chem in chemistry labs all the time, but there is a very simple way to solve it. You stop the reaction and purify. Stop sure, and sure. Purify, stop and purify, and that's and they are so used to doing that, chemists, synthetic chemists, that they never think of it as a problem or something to solve. You just purify. Say, uh, but so, in natural conditions, there is no graduate student to do the purification for you. So you have the arithmetic demon is real there. But that's actually quite interesting because every time when the few uh, purify them, they actually they put the stage up higher so they become yeah. initial conditions. Yes. So, so yeah. that's actually the filter theory we're thinking. Yes, is so, so, but in this case, it's instead of a graduate student, the purification happens by some natural phenomenon or something which happens on its own. It's either uh, 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 the function of self-healing or self-repair. That's one way to be the arithmetic demon. Another way, very important way to uh, beat the arithmetic demon in prebiotic chemistry is to choose your handedness early on. Uh, as soon as you start producing racemic mixtures, if you have molecules which, uh, you know, uh, 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 stereoisomers, then your yields of the one that you need is automatically less than 50%, you know, because you produce also uh, the other one. So if you have a, uh, an antomeric excess early on, that helps you immensely in solving the arithmetic demon. So they all kind of uh, UVC light also turns out to 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 selectively break or degrade uh, isomers uh, uh, other than the ones that are left today, which is very interesting. A smoking gun, as they say, that uh, UV light was involved early on, that also increases your yields, and again beats the arithmetic demon. So all of those three things. Uh, help you, uh, but the third one, the one which is relates to information, 
is the one you're referring. And that happens at the very last point is when you start polymerizing. So when you start polymerizing, whether a particular sequence will be uh, self-healing or not uh, depends on what are what is the coding, what are the bases, so how are they arranged. Some of them work better and others less so. And that is a moment at which information is retained about what works to get to the next level, as you said. That makes make, make sense because uh, so now we actually really, at that time we put the five layer of the lecture. So initially like a basic article item physics. So that the, the follow the physics law, but as soon as it gets into chemi chemical world, does it become chemical law, right? But then in the initially life that you are working on, so that at that time before they capture the uh, mitochondria, everything is totally another law. I mean, as you just try to figure them out. But as soon as they have the first cell, we think the law completely changed. The, the, just, the game just become generally shifting. And then to create information to go. So, uh, of course, a higher layer is when the, uh, you know, the society formed the, the culture technology as another driving force so the, the game changed again so so that's a that's a way we therefore we against the universal law to explain all the five stages we think each stage has their own law so so you you kind of you agree with this yes. yes and we are finding this empirically that is because we are working with individual molecules you kind of it either works or doesn't work and it's very clear that this is the only way in which it would work. Sure. So, so, so one more question for, about your experiment. You mentioned in your experimental setting, every time you can repeat this in just a short time, 20 minutes or something, to form certain structure. But are you talking about use identical experiment condition or you use actually different condition or can achieve such a efficiency? Yeah, so that's a good question. And it's still under investigation uh, because it takes time to try to find the boundaries in which this works. So the chemistry that I'm referring to is, uh, we call it cyanosulfidic chemistry. It starts with uh, cyanides. Uh, hydrogen cyanide is kind of the prototypical molecule. Um, but uh, the hydrogen cyanide is in water. So in water, usually it's a number of salts, which are cyanides, ferrocyanide, um, um, copper cyanide, and others. Under planetary conditions, this will be the ones that are preserved um, at the bottom of lakes, for example. So uh, it's sulfidic, cyanosulfidic, because um, Sulfur anions are very important to the chemistry as well. Uh, they are the um, ones which are produced by sulfur dioxide gas dissolved in water, which also uh, we think on the early Earth or on planets like the Earth is common. And of course, hydrogen uh, sulfide, which um, quite often comes in uh, hydrothermal vent areas near volcanoes and so on. So uh, the two of them. Um, uh, uh, kind of at the start of this chemistry, which after, as I said, seven steps, uh, pr starts producing the full, fully activated nucleotides, the nucleotides which then self-assemble into polymers. And so basically um, what we find now is that this chemistry um, works pretty well under a fairly wide range of temperatures from eutectic, meaning close to zero, all the way to um, temperatures about 70, 80 Celsius. It uh, works in fairly broad uh, pH ranges from about six and a half, pH of six and a half, seven to nine. Uh, so this is kind of the range of pH. And then there is a number of other requirements, which is, you know, what is the amount of UVC light. We have found already in my group what are the, uh, how much is too much or how much is too little. There is definitely a, um, 
threshold. If there is not enough UVC light, none of this chemistry actually happens, even doesn't start. Um, there is some concentrations requirements. Uh, you need a certain amount of cyanide because it's stoichiometric. You, that's how you build your uh, carbon and nitrogen based molecules. Um, you need a certain amount of um, the sulfur anions and you need a certain amount of metal ions in the water, which again, naturally should occur. Magnesium two plus is a very uh, important uh, of those uh, ions that um, help with the self-replication. But again, you, 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 if you have too much of it, um, that's a problem. So again, there is a concentration range. So um, what I just described to you is quite a flexible uh, uh, system. So um, that's why I even said, you know, as an astronomer, even I can run this without being very careful about the pH, without being very careful about the concentration in a very sloppy way. If I run it, I still get high yields. And by high yields, I mean, um, uh, more than 30-40% uh, of the monomers at the end. And they are in a, in, in a state activated where they can actually polymerize. So, so in other words, the whole sequence from uh, the original cyanide salts and the water and the little bit of sulfur dioxide with UVC light all the way to the, your little polymers is doable in a very badly run sloppy chemical lab like mine. <laughs> but the so-called sloppy lab maybe is real in other situation because I strongly against the too Absolutely. pure the system. Absolutely. Side. So I'm saying this uh, laughing, but actually this is this was this is where I see my goals in my own group is to actually make everything dirty on purpose dirty and sloppy on purpose because um, under natural conditions, that's what it is. Yeah. We don't have a clean environment. In fact, uh, our main project right now is called the Dirty Water Project. <laughs> that's sure, 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 sure. Because we put in the water anything that we can imagine was there. Uh, and uh, we want to see what happens. Um, you know, if you can do it um, in a very clean room conditions, fine, you will if that that's what my colleagues who are trying to do the simple protocell you know um, uh, engineering project they're trying to be very clean because they want their only goal is to produce something which behaves like life they don't care if it's artificial completely in my case i'm actually trying to find something which is relevant to the natural origin of life and frankly um so far this has helped um, it, uh, the early experiments, which were done by some of my colleagues, were done under clean conditions. And for example, they missed some very important steps and couldn't make any progress because their conditions was too clean. In the moment uh, we, from the geochemistry point of view, said, well, you know, you're doing this in water, in, in neat water, but basically there was sulfur onions in it. Uh, I mean, we know that there was a lot of sulfur in the early earth. Have you ever put any in, in your solution? And I said, no, no, we, we just do it directly. So, so they went and did it that same afternoon while my postdoc gave the talk. Within half an hour, they had the answer. It actually worked. Something which they had tried to do for years before and several times had actually told us that it doesn't work, worked when they added essentially a pollutant to their uh, experiment. They polluted the experiment and then it suddenly worked with huge yields. The quantum yield is one. I mean, you can't do better. Yeah. So, so basically uh, it is not only uh, because we say, oh, the early earth was dirty, but I think it is also from engineering point of view, it has been the successful strategy for our team so far. And that is, I think, one of the reasons why the people who are doing the completely artificial uh, project, the engineering project, 
are having a hard time because they must be missing something in yes. the basic yes. chemistry. Yeah, I, I, I agree because uh, actually I'm writing another uh, chapter. It's uh, among specificity of biology. So you see where I'm come from because yeah. uh, that's uh, actually essential part. We actually miss this point completely because uh, so I, I actually, we, we consider the heterogeneity is the information. So that's, a, that's where we come from. So quite interesting. Very much enjoy your uh, answer question. So far, in the future, I will ask more, <laughs> but I just. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, Henry. It's a lot of fun. You, you have thought about it very deeply, I can see. Uh, this, I, this is the first time I, after I listened to your talk, I, I start to thinking about some of the questions, <laughs> but uh, you know, we should discuss more. <laughs> it, well, it's a new field. Um, you know, people have always worked on the origin of life, but it's always been a few people here and there, you know, uh, no big teams, uh, not much resources and funding. I think it's the first time now in the last few years that people are kind of more people are getting into it. And we are making progress, which is great, you know. Great. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Henry. Henry, and also, by the way, for anyone who's interested and has been enjoying this back and forth, Henry's Q&A is actually in one hour. So if you want more of this, feel free to come back for that. <laughs> uh, the next question that we have here is from Viral. Could Dr. Sasalov inform us about the Origin of Life Initiative? For example, how, how is it funded? What disciplines does it have? Do, the, do they recruit new faculty members or scientists and so on? Uh, yes, of course, uh, but I'll be happy to tell you. So uh, we call it the Harvard Origins of Life Initiative. Um, it started about 10 years ago with uh, initial funding from the university, Harvard University. Uh, Harvard University at the time was looking for new interdisciplinary uh, ideas, initiatives, as they call them. Uh, and we um, wrote a proposal. Um, uh, the same group of us who are still with the initiative. And um, there were apparently about 70 different proposals and about six of them were selected by uh, the Harvard University administration. So we got the initial amount of money to start. Um, and that's why I was joking. I had, we had a meeting with the president of Harvard and uh, part of it was uh, the budget. Um, so uh, today the initiative is funded uh, still partly by the university at a smaller level and partly by private funds. We have two private um, uh, uh, funders who uh, fund us. Uh, we've had occasionally uh, uh, funds from, the, uh, um, from both NASA and the um, uh, National Science Foundation. Um, in NASA in particular, they had um, the so-called Astrobiology Institute and money that went to what NASA calls astrobiology. Uh, but I have to say that it's generally uh, still difficult to um, f find us, to put us in the right niche for this kind of funding, uh, federal funding, because we are not really either NASA related or medically related or because we are a mixture of all of that. So our team is almost evenly distributed between the Harvard Medical School and the Harvard uh, Science and Engineering side uh, with people from several departments and several disciplines and schools, not just departments. Uh, so we obviously have astronomers like me, several of us, well, three of us. Uh, we have geochemists and geogeologists, uh, another three or so. There are, you know, maybe a dozen very active members and 30 less so in orbit around us. We are completely open to anybody at Harvard, but because the funding is coming only from Harvard, um, unfortunately, it's difficult for us to fund especially our students who go to other universities. So they have to find it by themselves. And most places have not awakened yet to how interesting this topic is and still consider it too crazy to, to fund. 
Um, but um, we have been able recently to um, find a private foundation which funds kind of an international extension of our team. It's the Simons Foundation and it's called the Simons Collaboration on the Origin of Life. We didn't call it initiative just to separate the Harvard Initiative from the collaboration. And in this case, all of us at the Harvard Initiative uh, have added with the help of the foundation, uh, faculty members and scientists and uh, postdocs uh, who come from different countries and different institutions, both in the US and uh, so, um, yes, we always look for new um, um, members. Um, we don't have yet enough funding to recruit faculty members. We hope in the near future we will have that funding to be able to do that. But we do have funding for postdoctoral fellows and students. And through the Simons Foundation, the co collaboration there, occasionally we can fund faculty members in other institutions. So basically, if you're more interested in, in how you can get involved, please just email me. Um, it's very easy to find my web page and my email and uh, we can talk. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, well, we have about 20 minutes left uh, if we continue to have questions. My personal question for you, Dimitar, is can you elaborate on what you mentioned right in the beginning? You said, I'm an astronomer. Uh, there has been a asteroid touchdown. Is that what you said? Yep. Yes. <laughs> um, well, um, let me see. I can even show you some pictures, but if you go to the I mean, just Google asteroid touchdown NASA and you will see the, the image from yesterday. Uh, so I'll explain in words. So there is um, for many years, and I'm going to connect it. For many years, people have studied meteorites, small stones that fall from the sky, which are pieces of bigger bodies, which are asteroids or comets. Comets are like asteroids, but have a lot more water and gases. So that's why they have these beautiful tails. But basically, other than that, they look the same. They're small bodies, which are usually irregular and have a lot of rocks and uh, sharp things on top of them and so on. And so the meteorites are pieces of those when they fall on the earth. And meteorites come in different forms metal ones or iron ones, stony ones, and some, which are very unusual, which are called carbonaceous chondrites because they have a lot of carbon. Or the better way to put it, they look like pieces of asphalt. And they actually even smell that way. If you, if you have a piece that you can hold in your hand, eventually it smells like it was a piece of the uh, street pothole outside. It looks actually like a piece of the asphalt from the pothole. Uh, they're very curious looking things and we always wondered where they come from. Uh, people think maybe cometary nuclei or something like that, but obviously they are material, obviously to mineralogists and geologists, they are material which never uh, experience extremely high temperatures and pressures. All the rocks that you see on the earth, one way or the other have experienced a lot of uh, baking, if you will. And uh, um, uh, uh, these are rocks which you will never find on the earth, uh, naturally. Again, asphalt is kind of a man-made thing. Uh, so basically, um, how do they come? Where do they come from? And if you look really closely into them, uh, you find organic molecules, including people have found uh, the bases, canonical bases, as well as non-canonical bases, because obviously it was not related to life. Like in tar pits, asphalt again, you will actually uh, have relation to life, obviously. But in this case, it's organic chemistry, but not necessarily life. But it's very interesting organic chemistry. And so people always wanted to find the source of those meteorites, which are very rare. And uh, we discovered that some asteroids appear to be the source. That is, they have, as we look from afar, 
they're very small. And as you look from afar, their properties appear to have those same carbonaceous um, signatures. And one of them, which is fairly close to the Earth, meaning its orbit uh, comes close to the Earth, is called Bennu, which apparently is an Egyptian god, but that's the name of it. And uh, about 10 years ago, a group of astronomers and geochemists said, we need to uh, design a space mission to go to Bennu and pick up some material and bring it back to Earth. So that, first of all, we can see whether it's the same material which we already have as meteorites. And second, to find out what, what it is, what's made of and what it's in. Because what comes down as meteorites is usually also damaged from the infall through the atmosphere. You know, you've seen meteors, they burn. And so this happened, NASA approved it. Uh, it's, this mission is called OSIRIS-REx. It left to go to Benno in 2016. It's been around Benno for two years now. And they've been mapping it. They've been deciding how to get and touch it and get the sample. And uh, 24 hours ago was the big moment when they actually came to the surface with something which looks like a vacuum cleaner and pulled some of that sample for uh, what I hear from my colleagues, it was successful. That is, they got a lot of sample. They have video, which they showed uh, last night at the press conference. And uh, it's fantastic. You can see that it worked uh, as planned. And so we are all very excited. So now this uh, canister, which is full of uh, material, several coffee cups of material, that's what they <laughs> how they say how much they think they hope they've gotten uh, is coming back to earth it will arrive in 2023 so we have to wait for two years um, and it will land and then uh, many of us including in our labs here but especially in NASA will have some of this material and we'll be able to study it with the big you know microscopes and materials and so on so it's very exciting, including for the project which I just described, you know, the origin of life, but generally for astronomy, because we want to understand how planets form. And we think that planets form by getting bigger and bigger. They start with this material originally, and then as they grow bigger and bigger, that original carbonaceous soft material essentially melts and disappears into the rocks we see today. So um, that will be very exciting to see it for the first time. My goodness. See, I had no idea. I had no idea any of that was happening. It's very uh, exciting. Who yes. knows if I would have found out if I didn't do this Q&A session with you. There so, we go. So. Yes. It's very easy well, to go and find the video. from Yeah. Your yeah. And it really does look like a vacuum cleaner. I did a quick Google. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, well, that's, that's apparently it was the simplest design because people usually think, well, why didn't you grab some stuff? Because grabbers tend to break, you know, and uh, space engineers are very good at thinking all the way, all the different ways in which uh, the system could break. So they always come up with the simplest solution and vacuum cleaner was the simplest one. Absolutely. I, I think that is so cool. Well, we're coming up close at the end to the end of our time. So I'm curious if anyone has any final questions, this is your last chance to ask Dimitar Saslav your burning questions. Please pop yourself off of mute, put something in the chat. We'll wait like a minute. And if we don't hear anything, that might be the end of our time. So let's see, anyone have any, any further questions? Going once, going twice. All right, I'm gonna say that we're done. Oh, wait. All right. Viral said, thank you so much. It was a very informative session. I completely agree. Um, for all of you who have joined us, please join us for Henry Hang's session, which starts 
right on the hour. For me, it's 3 p.m. That's Central Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we would love to see you there and get all of your burning questions. Um, this has been so fun. I really appreciate all of and your knowledge. I also want to thank you, but to thank everybody for coming as well. And Henry, I uh, really want to continue the conversation, but I cannot come at four, meaning for your session, because I'm uh, the person who is uh, supposed to give a, an award, an annual award to someone, one of my astronomy colleagues, and it was scheduled for four o'clock today, so in, in our words, in 45 minutes. And there is no way I cannot show up because it will be very improper if the person who is supposed to introduce the awardee is not there. So I'm sorry to miss uh, the question and answer, but I want you just by myself. So we'll make sure to connect and talk. Sure, sure. And yes. thank you again to everybody. I can send you Henry's email if you would like, Dimitar. I have it yes. already, so we'll, we'll connect. Thank you, Tana. Bye. Great. Thank you guys so much for coming. I'll see you soon.